Dear friends, thank you for joining us today for our Antarctic Wildlife Webinar. Uh, as a lot of you know, my name is Kate and uh, I work at Sales and Marketing Department of Poseidon Expeditions and I will be your host today. Before we start, uh, from what we can see, uh, you can hear us and you can see the presentation, but just to be sure, can you please send us in the chatter box a pause? Uh, if you can hear us, me and Anya, and if you can also see the PowerPoint presentation on your screens, that would be really appreciated, just so that we're completely sure that everything is working well. Very good. We have a couple of pluses coming in, so that's working well. Uh, all right, so actually, during our Antarctic webinar or Antarctic wildlife webinar, we will be talking about many different and very interesting facts. And in particular, we will be talking about uh, the most numerous colony of penguins in Antarctica. We will also tell you how the leopard seals prefer their penguins. And one of the very, very famous questions, did penguins ever live in, Antar in the Arctic? And uh, before uh, we actually go into all of the interesting details, I would like to introduce to you my co-host of today's webinar, Anya, Anya Erdenruten. Hello, Anya, how are you? Hey, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice to see you as always. And we have been actually doing a couple of webinars with Anya and uh, we have provided tons of interesting and useful information. If you ever need a recording of previous webinars from us, just let us know. And Anya is talking to us from Germany. And as you know, I'm joining you from Moscow. And we're always very much interested to know where you, guys, uh, where you guys are based. We've already heard Australia all the way from Melbourne. And if uh, all the rest of the guests here could enter the countries where you are based in the chatterbox, that would be really great. We, we could learn geography that way of our <laughs> webinar. <laughs> All right, so we know about Austria as well, uh, United Kingdom, Adelaide, Australia as well. Wow, thank you so much guys for staying up a little late, a little late and joining us. Very good. Netherlands, Europeans are very active in terms of joining our webinars. So thank you very much guys. <laughs> and also a lot of, a lot of uh, guests from the UK. Well, that's great. Uh, we are quite international today. We're a little more international usually during our cruises, either to the Arctic or Antarctica. But uh, it's a very nice atmosphere. Uh, we really appreciate your time and joining us today. And before we actually go into all the interesting facts about penguins and other wildlife species, I would like to tell you a couple of words about Poseidon expeditions. Uh, and especially for those who are joining us for the first time. And Anya, I would really appreciate your help with the slides. So uh, Poseidon Expeditions is a um, leading tour, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> leading cruise operator in the polar regions. And we have actually been on the market for a little, a little more than 21 years. For the Arctic and Antarctic trips, we are taking the ship that's called Sea Spirit, and we can see it on the next slide right here, right, right in front of you. You know, when we are going to the polar regions, to have a small ship is really a big advantage. And we're very proud to operate Sea Spirit in both areas. Uh, and during the 21 years of operations, we have actually taken more than 20,000 adventure travelers to different areas. That includes, of course, the Arctic, Antarctica, and the North Pole. And of course, we are looking forward to the times when we can take guests to those areas again. Mm -hmm. um, when we are operating our trips in polar areas, our first goal is your experience. And of course, your experience highly depends on active exploration. That's what polar cruising is all about. But of course, you have to stay on the ship all the time, pretty much all the time. Uh, and of course, we, re we really take care of your comfort on the ship. All of that really composes great experience in the Arctic or Antarctica. And now I think it's time I give you a proper introduction of Anya. As uh, you probably already know, Anya is one of our main expedition leaders who works uh, both from home and also on the ships. Uh, Anya is helping a lot um, 
with our further planning of the itinerary and her knowledge and expertise is absolutely valuable to us. Anya, would you mind just saying a couple of words about yourself, maybe a couple of things about your experience of working in Antarctica? That would be really great. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Kate, for the introduction and welcome to everybody who has the time now and takes the time to listen to this webinar. That's very much appreciated and we hope that you will enjoy it. My name is Anya. Happy that there are some familiar names and faces here around. Very good. And I study tourism management. I'm a German and I started actually 20 years ago to work in polar uh, areas. I decided I do this as long as I enjoy it. And after 20 years, I must say I enjoy it more and more. I really miss the ship at the moment. So uh, this is something where I can say it's really a dedication and I enjoy this very much. As Kate already said, I'm on the ships for around three months. I'm in charge of the expedition team, of their training and of the program of the coordination. But I also enjoy now very much to be, well, you get a bit older, to be a bit more home as well, to be more involved in planning, permitting that we can go to South Georgia, that we can go to Antarctica. I work with the governments and it's a very nice combination, I think, to have the background, but also to still be on the ships, to still go out. I still lead expedition. I enjoy it very much. Doesn't matter if it's the North or the South, because it's always different, it's always unique. There is no day like the other. I think I'm a very untypical German, so to speak. I like the challenges and I, I like to know what is not coming. I, I, don't, I don't know sometimes what comes tomorrow. And I think that is, that is very good in our day. So I enjoy expedition leading and uh, I hope it transmits. And I'm very happy for everybody who has a slight interest. And after this presentation, I hope that you have even more interest or at least saw pictures from what you have experienced already. Exactly. Well, before we talk about who actually lives in Antarctica, about the different species, <laughs> Anya, do you mind just telling us a little bit more for those who probably haven't been to Antarctica or for those who are thinking to go, just a little bit of an overview of what Antarctica is? So here you just see an overview slide. We have um, Antarctica as a continent, of course, in the middle. You see the magnetic South Pole. And then Antarctica itself is separated into two parts, usually. You have the East Antarctica side and you have West Antarctica side. And for our presentation uh, today, we are going to take you to the area that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, everything above the Palmer land, that is the Antarctic Peninsula. I would like to talk today about uh, South Georgia, the Falkland Malvinas, and this is an area that is mostly visited. 95% of the continent is glaciated. Glaciers are coming all the way down. So here we have an area at the peninsula where we actually can have a chance to go ashore. And that is what we are going to talk about today. It is also the shortest distance, of course, when we have the Drake Passage to go to Argentina, one and a half, two easy days on the ship in comfort with a lot of lectures in the Drake Passage. And then we take you to what you always will read is the coldest, the windiest, the driest continent on earth. And I can promise you, and I hope you will agree after the presentation, it's also one of the fascinating ones. And please, um, I get very excited when I talk. We have a lot to cover on this presentation. There are actually several lectures we try to combine in one. And I have a tendency to go very quick when I get excited. And if I get too quick, please uh, put it in the shutter box as well. And Kate will give me a very polite sign. And then I will be a bit uh, slower, I promise. But please stay with me. It's a super topic. <laughs> Sounds great. We will monitor that, Anya, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so now we talked a little bit about Antarctica. We are not going to focus today on icebergs and glaciers. We just put a few pictures in because the topic of today is wildlife. But of course, um, it is absolutely fascinating. You have huge glacier fronts. We have the process when the 
icebergs are breaking off, for example, uh, from the glaciers. This is called carving. Then we have icebergs that are created. It's a big part of the experience. No matter how often you have been there, icebergs are always interesting. They are always uh, different every time. The shapes, the uh, colors they are different. So, and it doesn't matter how often you have been there, as I said, but you only see a tenth of an iceberg, which I find super fascinating. You have the very big ones, you have the smaller ones, you have uh, the movement of uh, the ice itself. I enjoy very much when uh, we see the icebergs, when we can go cruising. Maybe we are out for two hours in our zodiacs, just enjoy the scenery, the silence, the noise sometimes of the ice. But um, I also hope always for our guests that you have one day with a little bit overcast weather. Because when you have the sunshine and the blue sky, it looks great. But actually, once you have the overcast weather, then you get the blues, then you get the shades. And uh, I think that is something hopefully everybody can experience. Now it's a little indication we have an overcast uh, sky and you see already the different blue colors and uh, mm, you will be infected by the polar virus. And please, Many people, they take 100 pictures of the first small iceberg. Wait a little bit, wait. There will be others. We don't uh, can promise the whole thing, all the animals that you see today, but ice, we will promise. So take your pictures also a little bit later. You will have thousands of pictures uh, of icebergs and also thousands of pictures of wildlife because there's going to be so much. And just a little tip in the beginning, when you get home, and you show pictures at home to your friends that maybe have never been to this area. An advice, choose five pictures of icebergs and five pictures of penguins, not thousands that you have taken. Because it, for you, every penguin will tell a story, every wildlife. But if you want that your friends stay friends, choose a few nice pictures. It's, it's amazing what you will do. We do have photographers on board that will help you. We have the biologists. So yeah, it's, it's always uh, the same. I don't take pictures anymore because uh, it's just too much. Yeah? Um, we have an abundance of wildlife in Antarctica because if you have Antarctica as a continent itself, we do have the currents around Antarctica and we do have the, wi the winds. That means that there's a lot of turbulence in the water, especially through the currents, of course. This means that we have a very productive atmosphere in the water and we have an abundance of plankton and of krill. So that means that of course there is a lot of wildlife that is attracted to these colder waters. We have seals that we are going to talk about. We are going to talk about the penguins that are of course present in Antarctica as well. Not only the small ones like here we have the gentoo and the shin strap that you see in the picture we are going to talk about the kings and where you can see them, because it's always a big question. We have sometimes pictures of sandy beaches. Usually they are really done on the Falklands, on the Malvinas. And uh, of course, we are going to talk about the albatross. Here we have some black proud. If you look very closely, you see some rock hoppers. So there's a lot to talk about. And Antarctica on your voyage and with the expedition team that are experts, and we have a very small vessel, so you will get in touch with us a lot. We are going to talk about the wildlife. We are also going to talk about history um, of polar exploration and of science, because that is a big part of it. Here in the picture, you see um, actually Grütwigen. We are going to talk about whales and whaling belongs of, to it. So we are going to talk about this a little bit uh, later. It's a big part of history. For example, there is Sir Ernest Shackleton that is uh, buried in South Georgia. Here we have the grave of him. There are, of course, on the peninsula stations. Yes, we have the Antarctic Treaty that says Antarctica is a place for peace and science. But for example, the Antarctic Peninsula, there are claims from different uh, countries, for example, Chile, Argentina, and also the UK have claims. Here we see a picture from Paradise uh, Bay that is a British station, the Brown Station. Or, of course, uh, we 
also have former stations that are now museums. This is Port Lockroy, um, very interesting post office, more or less, a little museum, you can spend some money, but you also see a lot of penguins around. And that is a place uh, that's very interesting, uh, like many other stations uh, that we have around. I like it a lot because I was able to spend two weeks here many years ago as part of the team there. And uh, it was great to have the combination of history, but as you see, a lot of penguins around as well. And we are going to talk about penguin smell a little bit later. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anya. I think it does give you a good um, picture of what you can actually see in Antarctica, of course, in brief. Uh, but I think when it uh, comes about thinking about Antarctica, the first thing that comes to your mind is the penguins, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we should pay a little respect to the guys <laughs> over there and uh, talk about the different kinds of, of the penguins. Definitely. I mean, uh, when people think about Antarctica and the difference for me between Antarctica and Arctic is that in the Arctic, you have an active search for wildlife, for polar bears, for muskox, for reindeer. In Antarctica, you, you have a lot of wildlife. It's abundant. And of course, we have the penguins and everybody wants to see uh, the penguins, which I very much understand. Before we start, I really have to say that we are, as I said, trying to cover a lot of topics. So please do not expect now a real detailed thing about every wildlife that we are showing. We chose a few slides. We picked a few interesting things that maybe you don't know about, or we thought that could be interesting. And if you are interested then to know more, you come on board and then we have our expedition team and we give you the full lecture. So that is, of course, we give you a little teaser and I hope that then later we can see you. Penguins you see for sure at the Antarctic Peninsula, they are the Gen 2 uh, penguins that you see here. Um, it's a very easily to identify penguin. You see it has an orange bill and you see that it has a nice patch actually directly over the eye, the white patch. It is a smaller penguin that mainly eats fish and crustaceans, but don't underestimate it just because it is small because it can do big dives. Usually it is in the surface of 20 meters, but it can go down to 165 and, uh, meters. And I think when you see this small one, it, it really needs a lot of respect what these little guys can actually do. They are in the uh, colonies. Of course, the more the merrier, especially <laughs> for the Gen 2, that's what they like. And when you're coming uh, to Antarctica, for example, in October, November, very often we have the times where we have huge flocks of penguins coming back. They are building then uh, the nests. We have the courtship going on. I'm going to talk about that also a little bit later. And then um, we uh, do have the chicks approximately end of December in January. The gentle penguins, they have actually quite a strong pair bond. We get this question uh, quite early and they try to locate the partner from the former season approximately 90% of the time, which is quite high for birds, actually. As with most penguins, the small ones, they do lie two eggs. But from the two eggs, usually only one chick uh, will survive. And also one egg is a little bit smaller uh, than the other. And then you can say that the survival rate actually for the chicks can be traced to the amount of food that is in the breeding area, so that also differs. We will see them a lot, and sometimes people say, oh, we have another landing, another Gen 2, but come on, you're coming to see penguins, we see a lot, we try to show them to you, and this is the most uh, abundant in the area that we can really go, and that we can show you, so you better start to love them, they're around 300 to 350,000 pairs, not counting, of course, the ships. And, um, at the peninsula, once again, we will see them quite a lot. And when you have these views uh, with the icebergs and, of course, around all the penguins in the water, it is a fascinating sight. So Gen 2, we have quite commonly at the area of the Antarctic Peninsula. One that is really nice is a shin strap, very clear where the name comes from. You see the little shin uh, on the little strap uh, down below. 
It is a small penguin. It is only around 70 centimeters, maybe four kilos uh, approximately heavy. And for me, they are the real mountain climbers. They are the mountaineers. I'm amazed sometimes how high they go to have their nesting place, how high the rookeries are. It is not uncommon to have them approximately 100 meters high. That is a lot of effort and a lot of energy actually that they have. And why do they do that? The thing is that the penguins that are going the highest up, that occupy the highest places, are very experienced breeders. They are the ones that know the higher up you go, the earlier this area is ice free, and the longer time I have to have breeding success. So actually it's a very smart idea. And you can see they have also these kind of toenails, one can say, so they are very, very good climbers. They are also extremely noisy. When you have ever been to a rookery, they are noisy. Sometimes you cannot really hear anything, especially when it's a time of the courtship. They're extremely uh, sociable. They're also very feisty. So within the rookeries, the neighbor better keep some distance. Otherwise, there are neighbor fights. It's real trouble. And they have also uh, usually two eggs. If they are lucky, they can raise the two chicks, as you have here. The chicks, as all others, they are uh, going into the crash, into a kindergarten when they're around one month old. And then it takes them um, approximately uh, 60 days to fledge. And then later they go to sea and the adults are molting. What we see for the shin straps is that we have a little bit increasing the numbers actually in Antarctica at the peninsula. There are around 7 million around. What we don't know about this reedy penguin is what they do in the winter time, because uh, they go away, they go um, away from the pack ice. They do not return before uh, the next breeding season uh, starts. So between, let's say, April and then October, it's, it's not so much known what they do. So please don't ask any questions about it later, because there is no real scientific evidence uh, about where they go. But it's a very nice small penguin. Here you see uh, a mold, which is towards the end of the season. Penguins have a catastrophic mold, which means that they are shedding all their feathers in a very short time. But you have to imagine they don't have much time. So the old penguins are pushed out, the, the old feathers are pushed out by the new feathers growing. And during this time, the penguin cannot go into the sea because it's not waterproof. So it has to stand at one spot and it tries to reserve the energy as much as it can. And uh, then it, it's not snow around, it's all the feathers that you see here around uh, the penguins. That's approximately end of February, a picture from the March time. So far, all good? All good, thank you, Anya. Okay. Okay, because it's not done yet with penguins. There's never no. enough of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> because we put the pictures a little bit in the order at the Antarctic Peninsula, which penguins you will see most. So the most that you will see are gentoos. We are going to see shin straps. And also we are going to see hopefully adelis. There are less breeding uh, places uh, for adeli penguins. They are usually next to the emperor, we say, the true Antarctic penguin, because they breed further south. No other penguin except the emperor is breeding further south. Quite many of them, two and a half million pairs uh, approximately, but they do have a lesser pair bond. We just said that they are so far south. That means if you are so far south, you have a very short breeding season. And sorry to say, even if you love your mate, if your mate is late, you just cannot wait around. So if the mate doesn't come in time and the other one is ready for breeding, well, tough luck, there will be another mate. Yeah? And then we are trying to have a success in that season because it's all about survival and getting the chicks actually uh, in place. So, Sorry to say, folks who thought that penguins are always waiting and are always faithful, not the case. That was the myth. 
No, no, that's a myth. <laughs> um, I go back to this picture because uh, for many people, I think it is the penguin um, that is most commonly known. You see a lot of it actually in the media. It is very typical also because it's very black, has a white belly, um, and it is the one that has a white ring around the eye. Here you see it again, very nice penguin, very small penguin. The name, uh, by the way, was given by a French explorer. Uh, it was uh, uh, Dumont d'Urville, who named it after his wife. I don't know if he liked his wife. The penguin at least is cute. Uh, but it is said that always when he left for an expedition, his wife would come to the port and be really dressed with a black uh, uh, hat and very as if she is uh, really sad that he is leaving. So maybe the sailors thought that's why he gave the name, but that is the Adeli penguin that we have. And um, it is really a prototype, I think, penguin when we think about it. They are ones that like to have ice but they also need some open water because of course they need to go out uh, to get their food. They do not go too far away from their breeding places. So open water is very, very important for them. It is also a penguin that uh, is quite numerous in numbers. When you see a rookery, usually they are quite big. They do have a high mortality rate in chicks. Once again, that has to do with where they are breeding. And it said that around only 60% of the chicks really reach the crash stage so that they go into the kindergarten. But if they make it to end on a positive note, it can be 10 to 12 years old. So that is actually uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. And very often, uh, once again, you, you see it, but it's a bit harder to see there are fewer rookeries around at the peninsula, for example, than the ones that we had from the Shinstrap and also uh, from the Gentoo penguins that we have seen. So now we had the three small penguins that most likely you're going to see when you travel to the Antarctic Peninsula and, and just a few facts uh, about those ones. That sounds great. And Anya, thank you so much for giving such interesting information. Actually, when I went to Antarctica, I got to see all of those types. I think it was a <laughs> very nice experience, exactly. Um, when we go, we do see a little bit of every uh, kind, uh, but what would be the most numerous colony that's, uh, that's actually in Antarctica? Well, there are some very numerous uh, colonies. Some have been just discovered, but uh, the thing is, I prefer to say that one of the most numerous colonies that we can see where you really have something from is a place called Kuvabu at okay. the Antarctic Peninsula. And that is what it looks like. You really have a lot. And of course, the, as soon as you have a lot of penguins in numbers, you do have a lot of smell. Many people are not aware of that. But <laughs> penguins are cute. And damn, they stink, especially towards the end of the season. So we have a specific smell of a penguin and uh, I was lucky enough as I said to be in Lockroy very close to penguins at a place with no shower uh, as well so I remember when I came back after two weeks to the ship I didn't realize anymore but for the crew on board I smelled like a huge penguin it's in the hair it will be in your clothing you feel it also when you're coming back and not only we can smell the penguins by the way but also like all birds, penguins can smell. The question comes sometimes, so penguins actually can uh, smell and they use the smell to uh, recognize the family and also to avoid that they are uh, breeding with too close relatives. Okay. So. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, in the behavior of uh, different penguins, it's a lot of different patterns, right? Uh, and uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit more about interesting things in their life circle of life now of course of course um as mentioned already penguins they like to be in uh, in large colonies um they like to attract their breeding partners and like everywhere they uh, really want to have their attention their attention seekers um so to speak 
uh, we have a lot of display. It varies from the penguins, actually. They have sometimes really rituals uh, that they are doing. And maybe interesting to know is that once they start the ritual, it's very much uh, imitating behavior that you have in the rookery itself. Because if this step couple here, for example, starts to be the first one, the other couples will actually uh, follow. Um, so the others will just uh, do what they are doing. And scientists say that the larger the colony, the noisier is it, the more we have, they have this imitating behavior and the more we have a synchronization in the breeding, because the courtship is at the same time, that means they will have also the eggs at the same time, the chicks will be raised at the same time. And that is a big benefit for the penguins as well, because it means when there are more in numbers also for chicks, the chance of survival for the chick, for the single chick, is also much higher. So that is something that comes uh, together. The males usually arrive first. They are going to collect the stones. They are going to uh, build a nest. And that is a time really good to see in, let's say, November. Uh, November is a lot of activities and uh, a lot of nest building. By the way, in Lockroy, there had been an experiment. And they did put some colored rocks. They just paint, painted them red in some of the nests. And it was not in some, in one nest, and maybe five stones. And they wanted to see how it moves, because the rocks do not stay in the same nest, because penguins are stealers. Mm -hmm. And if a penguin is sitting on the nest and is not closely guarding it, the penguin from behind is stealing a rock, because he wants it from his own nest. And in this moment, while this penguin steals, another penguin steals from his nest. And it was interesting to see that within a very short time, these few colored rocks were all over the rookery. So then you could really see how things are moving on and they are very good with it. Um, penguins also, that is part of their behavior, uh, like to keep their nest clean. Doesn't mean that they care about their neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are too close, it is bad luck. So, and now, I had a bit more time to do research and read a bit more. There are even scientific studies, believe it or not, about the velocity of penguin poo. I don't know, some people had even more time than I had now, but about the, the angle and everything. So super interesting, come to the ship and I'm just prepared a recap about it if you want to know <laughs> more about uh, this part of the behavior. But of course, uh, courtship is very big. And um, the penguins are also feisty when others are coming too close, so they are very protective. And there always comes a question, how do you know who is male and who is female? And you have to come at mating season because that's the only time where you can see it. Male is on the top, female is below. And sometimes when you see also the coat and you see the feathers, and the feathers on the back are very unclear and a bit ruffled, that was a female because you can see the claws directly from the male penguin. So then you can distinguish who is male, who is female. Otherwise, you cannot do it. And maybe for the ones that have been there in early season, typical is also a penguin highway. <laughs> penguin highway is a little walkway for the penguin. As I mentioned, sometimes they go very high up. So if they have the same path, that means they lose less energy. So uh, penguin highways is something you can really, really commonly uh, see. And of course, what you see a lot in summertime, when it's getting very hot, sometimes it's too hot for penguins. And then you see here on this picture, that's why we put it in the underside of the uh, flippers. And when a penguin is getting too hot, a typical behavior is that it's laying also on the stomach. It puts the flippers around so that the underside is uh, basically airy. The feet are also going up so that there can be some exchange and that they get a loss of heat. They're doing some panting. And that is also some typical behavior that we are going to see. Well, sounds good. Uh, it, it's very interesting to learn about uh, things like that. 
and you know, actually, one of the common questions uh, that we have talking to partners and uh, future travelers, a lot of them actually want to see the chicks. And we have actually seen a very nice pictures of those encounters. Uh, what do you think, Anya, would be the best uh, time for those who want to see the chicks of different penguins to go to Antarctica? Once again, every month is different, what you can see, but if you particularly want to see uh, chicks, very small ones, when they're just hatching, usually end of December, January is a time for you to come. Because the pattern for these small penguins is always uh, the same. So the eggs are late, let's say until uh, November, then both parents are sitting on the egg. They have an incubation, let's say of around 35 days and both male and female, by the way, uh, do this work. And very often they do have the two eggs where survival rate is better for only one. And um, so these pictures are from around end December. So end December, uh, January, that is really where you see them. I like very much also mid January and January because then you see the, uh, the feeding then you see how the penguins, the adults are taking uh, care. Um, I like also the end of the season. For example, when you have the little bit bigger uh, chicks, for example, when you have like here, there, of course, they are very cute and very nice uh, pictures, but I like those ones. I love the teenagers. That is around uh, February time. You see that they are still uh, molting. They are very curious. They want to know what's going on there in small kindergartens. And sometimes you might even see uh, some penguins and they are white. Uh, they are no albino penguins. They are actually called lycistic. And uh, this just means that they have a lack of pigmentation. Happens that you see at some places, it's rather uncommon. But for chicks, let's say end of December, January, a very good time to come. Um. Thank you, Anya. Uh, I think you're, you're lucky if you get to see one of the uh, white ones. <laughs> oh, very. <laughs> They're very interesting. Um, of course, uh, there are a couple of places in the world where you can see penguins, but I think one of the most popular question uh, would be, um, are, they, are there actually penguins in the Arctic and can they actually travel there? Um. Well, penguins are in the in the south, yeah, because we have that's why we have the the boundary uh, between the north and the south. Uh, we see some changes in the uh, the climate, so that the, uh, the penguins where they used to be when I went first, maybe to find Adelis, they are now at different places. Uh, but actually, um, let me go back here. Um, Penguins have been actually in the Arctic. And I mean, many people don't believe it, but there has been an experiment, uh, no kidding, it's true. There was an experiment and that was in 1936, 1938. And there was a number of penguins that was brought to Norway, to the Lofoten Islands. And uh, these were mainly macaroni and kings that were brought. And the last sighting was in 1954 of those penguins because they did not succeed. Um, now we talked already that they do need numbers to breed successfully. And they were just not brought in big enough numbers. They could have been there, but they were not able to breed. The socializing pattern was missing. If you go to a zoo, they have bigger numbers, but these numbers they brought to the north uh, it didn't work and actually it's very good that it didn't work because they would have occupied a niche that is reserved for other arctic birds so but yes penguins have been in the arctic but not anymore it's very interesting fact it's uh, pretty cool actually <laughs> exactly um well it's uh, it's it's very nice to know such uh, you know great interesting background about the penguins and about their lifestyle uh what they do and what they don't and how they you know socialize um, but of course, apart from the penguins, when you go to Antarctica, there is definitely other species that we see quite a lot, uh, again, on different occasions. So how about we talk about seals? I know that there's different, there are different kinds and you can also see them in different situations when you are going to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. uh, the seals are very well adapted 
uh, to, of course, the polar regions. They do have a very, very thick uh, coat. They have a blubber uh, that keeps them warm. Their nostrils, they can close them basically when they enter the water. They, they do exhale actually the air. They do exhale before they dive because uh, in this way, they can reduce the amount of air in the lungs that reduces the heart rate and the metabolism. So that's quite interesting. We are very lucky also today that we see a lot of uh, seals because they were very heavily exploited by the sealers uh, in the 18th century. But now, of course, we have a good recovery. And we show a few pictures uh, of some seals that you might see. And one of the cutest ones, I think, is this Vedel seal. It is also one of the largest seals that we have. It can be up to three meters long, around 450 kilos heavy. And it always uh, seems to smile. It is the most southern mammal, actually, that we have in the world. It is a fantastic diver. Uh, and it can dive um, very, very deep to reduce also the heart rate. And what it finds in the depth of up to 750 meters is cod. Uh, it really likes to eat cod. And when you think about the cod, the cod alone can be one and a half meters long and really 70 kilos heavy. So it, it has amazing hunting skills when we have the Vedel seal. We usually find it laying on the ice. It is breeding further south. And that is a seal when you see a documentary. You know, sometimes you see documentaries and then you have a seal that is keeping the little breathing holes open uh, with the teeth, that is usually a Vedel seal. And Vedel seals, that's also one of the reasons uh, maybe why they die later, because they use the teeth to keep it, the, the ice open and the ice hole for breathing. And of course, if the teeth are done, they cannot feed anymore. And that is one of the, also a reason next to others why they are dying, but they can be around 12 uh, years old. It is a very, very vocal seal. Some places um, we have the chance actually to have them also on the land. And even sometimes when they are sleeping, they do make a lot of sounds. And they are known to make around 49 different uh, kind of vocal sounds. So if you are interested, Google it, Vedel seal sounds. It's fantastic what you find already on the internet. Another seal that we will see often is the crab eater seal. Um, has a little bit a dog-like snout, I always uh, think. It's smaller than the Vedel seal. And uh, the name is very misleading because it says crab eater seal, but it doesn't eat crabs. Yeah, it should be called a krill eater or something like this because it mainly feeds on krill. It has very specialized teeth and the teeth, they are going together like this. Yeah? So basically it takes a big gulp of water then it can close the teeth, the water goes out and the krill is in it. So it's, it acts like a sieve. It's very specialized uh, on this one. It is a seal that is super abundant. That means I think we have around 15 million. So we should have a chance to see one or a few more on the ice flow. And very often when they are laying together, you see scars on the crab eater seal. Like for example, here, the seal on the left hand side, you see it has some scars. And actually these scars are made um, by leopard seals because when they are young, uh, they are often preyed on by leopard seals. And then you can see the scars also all over the bottom. They are very slim seals. They're very fast. I mean, they can swim 25 kilometers an hour, which I find very amazing. And um, the numbers of seals of this seal is increasing. Interestingly, we will talk about whaling later. When the whaling really was at its high, the seals, the crab eater seals came in numbers bigger because they had more krill that they, can, that they could feed on. So it's always something on both sides. And then there's one that is really interesting, the leopard seal. It has a spotted coat. That's why also the name, uh, the leopard seal. It's very easy to identify. It's, it's big. I mean, it's three meters long, has a very, very, slender and very long head. Uh, usually it is solitary. That means you find it usually alone. Very, very rare that you have uh, more on an ice floe. 
And it's built for speed. That is a predator. I mean, look at these teeth. The teeth are very similar to what the crab eater has. So it also actually can sieve the water, but they have some, they are very pointy and very sharp. So this one, it can really catch the krill, the krill and also penguins. And people always associate that the leopard seal only eats penguins. And please, that is a myth because it eats much more krill. It feeds much more on krill than actually it does on penguins. Penguins are 20% of their diet, but of course that is what we see. That is what we experience. It is a skilled hunter. It will really pack the penguin. If you ever see it, it's, it's not a nice sight, but it's nature. It will beat the penguin on the water so that actually the, the furry coat, basically the feather coat pops off and only the meat is left, which then the leopard seal will eat. And we see it a lot on ice flows. It's uh, very interesting. You don't go too close with your boat because this seal can leap up to two meters. It can make huge jumps. So we don't go too close to this one with your zodiac, but it is very, very curious. It, it likes to come also to the boats. It doesn't have to worry much. The only enemy it has are killer whales, orcas, but it can live up to 26 uh, years approximately. Well, you mentioned orcas, Anya. Um, mm. For me, when I went to Antarctica, I guess the biggest point was to see the whales. And I was lucky enough to, to do that, to spot some humpbacks. Um, let's talk about those species, because I think it's, uh, it's really, of course, you expect to see whales in Antarctica, but when you actually do, that's a real bonus of your wildlife encounters. Hmm. No, definitely. I mean, when you see this is, of course, is a drone picture, uh, which shows you how close you can get to whales. But imagine you're sitting in that zodiac or in the kayak, even better, uh, and you have those encounters. It, it is really something very special. Absolutely. When I started in the Antarctic and people asked me for seals many, uh, and whales many years ago, I would usually say that December, January, February are good times for whales. But I must say that in our days, with the changing patterns that we have with climate change, et cetera, we see whales now all the time. Uh, so the more you are out, of course, the more we are going to see, but uh, we also see whales at the beginning of the season. And I only picked a few. We are going to talk a bit about the minke, so small whale, the orca, and the humpback. Yeah? We have seen blue whales, but they are more in the area of South Georgia. They are making a very good recovery but then go to South Georgia and we have a slight chance for, for those ones. But minke, humpbacks and orcas is something we might encounter. And please, I'm German, I'm very careful. I will never promise and say we will encounter, we may encounter. That is something uh, that has to be very clear. Minke, you know, uh, many people, they, they are sometimes getting a bit mad when we announce minkies on the announcement system and then they come and they don't see them anymore. <laughs> but this is really tricky because a minke whale is a very small whale. It is very quick. Um, it's around eight meters only, but it's a very, very fast swimmer. That means when I announce it, usually it's already gone. It's, uh, it was there. <laughs> so please keep an eye out. It's not like other whales. So the more you are outside and look, the more you can see. But minkies are around. They can swim very, very uh, quickly. And uh, what's typical for a minke is when it dives, it does not show the fluke. It does not show the tail, which is called the fluke. And we have approximately 200,000 in Antarctica. But once again, it's a whale that is there. But you, as a guest, have to be active to see it, actually. Humpbacks, it's OK. When we see humpbacks, we can announce them. You still have time to put, to put your coat on, and most likely, the humpback is still going to be there. Very, very nice whale actually for, for watching. It is 15 meters long, approximately 48 tons. And um, what is typical for the humpback is that the fluke itself has individual pigmentation and that is like a fingerprint. So every whale has an individual marking and can be recognized by scientists. Uh, what you see here, so if you take a picture of the underside of the fluke, 
uh, and you send it into a scientific place like Happy Whale, they can actually uh, let you know where this whale has been before. The humpbacks, um, they are engulfing. It's a baleen whale. That means they're going through the water. They have the mouth wide open. They can expand it, which you can see here very nicely. They, they get a big gulp of water. They close it. They have baleens. And then the water is pushed out. And in that moment, the whale puts his tongue also to the upper part of uh, his jaw. So the water is really pushed out and it just eats the krill. It's pretty cool, I think. And also what, uh, what they are known for is bubble feeding. That means they are together, they are doing uh, air, they, they create bubbles around, for example, krill. And then the krill is confused. It doesn't know what to do anymore. And now the humpback is known. It comes from below, opens the mouth very wide and it's very good feeding. And that is also what you see here. And it has very huge uh, side flippers. They're around five meters long, very vocal whale. And once again, we can see them quite often. They are good known places for humpbacks and they like to be also cooperative with us so we can really watch them. And then there comes the orca or killer whale. I don't like the whale. I, I don't like the name killer whale. That's why we put it together because it's a misleading name. It's not a whale. What you have here is a dolphin. Yeah? So it's not a whale. So maybe if you want to take out something out of the seminar here, use the name orca. I think then you're a bit more appropriate. Nine meters long. Um, it's black on the top. It has these typical patches. It has these kind of saddles. There are different types that we have in Antarctica. And very, very typical is this big dorsal fin that we have. They usually travel in pods, and that means a group of them is going together. And you can easily recognize a male because a male has the longest dorsal fin. It can be up to two meters high. They do like penguins, uh, but they also eat small seals, as mentioned, fish, other whales. And there are super BBC documentaries about them. They have fantastic feeding topics with spy hopping. They are very skilled hunters. Um, they, they are really fantastic. Very quick travelers. So when we announce them, come out quick. Don't, don't get your coat. Just come out because they are very, very quick travelers. You know, sometimes we see that they hunt a penguin and then all the passengers are very active and it's interesting to see from the psychology point of view, all the passengers they are with a penguin and the penguin hops and tries to escape. You see the penguin purposing, suddenly the penguin is gone and it's really depressive on board then, nearly the psychologist and for all the guests. But keep in mind, you are there to observe nature and this is part of the nature. It's a feeding pattern and you're very lucky if you're ever able to see a humpback. Um, for example, if you see minkies and if you see orcas, I think you belong to the super lucky group of people. Very, very, very interesting animal. Absolutely. And you know, I just wanted to um, pay attention to the fact that all the pictures that we are showing, uh, they are taken during our cruises. So we do see humpbacks, we do see minkies, we do see orcas. Uh, of course, not probably during one and the same cruise, right uh, but throughout the season there's uh, lots of different encounters and of course they they are absolutely amazing and really once in a lifetime experience and i think now anya has a little bit of a history here about whaling yeah just a few slides uh, please or bear with me but i believe that this is part of your travel to antarctica doesn't matter if you go antarctica south georgia Whaling has happened and it had a huge impact and you can only make things better when you know a little bit about the history. And it was uh, Cook who came first with his vessel to this area and he saw in 1775 approximately the abundance of whales. He, he didn't really enjoy South Georgia, he thought it was a horrible place. But when he came back and he reported the numbers of seals and whales that he had seen, of course, he attracted a lot of these uh, sealers and whalers, particularly later on. And whaling has been very big. And this picture is taken also in Grütviken. You see a whale catcher. 
you see a harpoon that that was a um, for the whaler's point of view understand me Ryan from the whaler's point of view the harpoon was a huge invention because they also could hunt the fast whales the quick traveling whales that they didn't reach before which was of course a disaster uh, for the whale population quickly we had big whaling stations that were forming so whaling was not only done from the ships but also then from land-based stations they could be big there could be up to 300 people working in those whaling stations we can still see the remains of it and um, you have to imagine one place like this like Rüdwiken, could in a normal day cut 30 fin whales in 24 hours so they could proceed huge numbers of whales and of course, it had a huge impact on the entire whale population. It was good that later the whale uh, oil prices dropped down and it was just not in demand anymore. But that was only in the 30s. So we had quite a period from around 1904, when the first big uh, land-based stations happened, to around 1930, where around 175,000 whales were actually hunted down huge numbers. And it took a long time for the whales to recover. And that is now uh, slowly happening. And personally, I think it's part and it's part of our duty in the expedition business for educational purposes to go to these old remains or whaling stations to show what had happened in the past and how lucky we are that the numbers actually are now coming back in the whales. Absolutely. I think it's, it's quite important to, to understand what happened to the wildlife, you know, during the time uh, in those areas. Uh, of course, going to Antarctica itself is an epic experience. It's once in a lifetime. But I think there is also a benefit when you can actually combine Antarctica with South Georgia and Falkland Islands. Because, of course, South Georgia and Falklands, uh, those sub-Antarctic islands, they offer absolutely amazing and fantastic wildlife species and encounters. And uh, right now, Anya is going to talk a little bit more about those who are into, for example, bird watching. You can also enjoy this, um, <clears throat> uh, this part of traveling there as well. And we will talk about all the wildlife that's out there. And uh, please, everybody, bear with me. Uh... There's so much to talk and please understand that now already the topics we covered that are around four lectures that I have, have tried to combine for one hour lectures. And there's a little bit more to tell and we, we do hope that you still find it interesting. So please bear with us. We, we appreciate that also uh, very much because when you come to the areas, there are albatross that you can see. You can see very often uh, wandering albatrosses as we have here in the picture. Other albatrosses that we see are, for example, black-browed albatrosses. But if you want to see these species, you have a very good chance when you go to the Falklands Malvinas or you go to South Georgia. And especially the wandering albatross, uh, South Georgia is actually the stronghold. It's the largest flying bird. It's always very hard to have the perspective when you see it from a ship because you have nothing to compare it with. But when you have the wingspan, of a wandering albatross, it's around 3.7 meters. It's, it's enormous, this wingspan. And it spends most of the time, of course, uh, in the air. It's a fantastic glider. The plumage, which means the feathers, they are changing. So the younger the bird, usually I would say the more gray, the more dark it is. And the older the bird gets, the more white it is. It mainly likes squid uh, to eat. And a very good place to see the wandering albatross is really South Georgia. There are some places where they do have uh, their breeding. We have around 4,000 pairs of them, breeding pairs in South Georgia. The total population worldwide, 37,000 um, uh, pairs. And uh, just to make up for the penguins, the albatross pair for life. Yeah, they like to have the same partner. They will also um, wait. They are a bird that take a lot of effort into raising their chicks. First of all, they only start breeding and mating when they are 10 years old. It is very long, uh, actually, for a bird 
uh, to be ready for the first breeding. They have a very long incubation period. That means when they sit on the eggs, that's nearly uh, two and a half months that they sit on the eggs, they share the duties again, but that the chick is ready for uh, and readily fledged takes nine months. I mean, that's a, that's a very long time that the parents have to take uh, really care of it. And uh, also that, of course, they have a, the survival rate has to be uh, fine for those ones. It's a bird that you're very lucky to see and I'm going to see for 20 years. Uh, albatross are very special for sailors because we say that um, it is a bird that carries the souls of dead sailors. So that's why it was never hunted. It was never done anything to this bird. It's a bycatch, unfortunately, uh, for fishing, but for sailors, it's, it's a bird that is very dear and very, very special. Another bird that is special <laughs> is of course a king penguin. And please, we have always guests that are standing at the pier in Ushuaia, ready to go on a trip to the peninsula. And they come and tell me, we are so looking forward to see a king penguin. <laughs> and then all my alarm bells are going on because trouble is ahead. There are no king penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula. That's already something we just cannot fulfill. So please, if you have a specific interest, please ask always your booking agent. Ask us, can I really see this bird there? Because king penguins, you can see a um, few of them on the Falklands Marinas, but most of them in South Georgia. Come to South Georgia if you want to really see them. That is one of their strongholds. They are very high penguin. They are very tall. They're around 90, 95 centimeters, 12 kilo heavy. I think it's, it's quite a bird. Mm -hmm. They are extreme deep divers. Um, usually they dive for their food, which is this lanternfish. And also they like medium-sized squid. They dive usually 50 meters, but they can go 240 meters. So extreme, extreme uh, divers. They do breed in big numbers. And in South Georgia, we have these big rookeries. It is not uncommon to have 300,000 breeding pairs together. The, this means breeding pairs. Understand me right. There are no chicks yet counted in. So it's big numbers and it really really leaves you uh, speechless. You usually find them on, on sandy beaches, sandy beaches, and then you have a little raised slope and a little bit more in the, in the Cossack. Um, it's of course, you can see it here very nicely also. It's a bird that does not have a nest. The egg is standing on the fit foot, foot. Now here I am. The egg <laughs> is standing on the foot and it has a brood patch so that it keeps it warm but it stays on the on the foot so there is no nest as such for our king penguin but but look at this i mean if you see this this is breathtaking and if you ever see that you're extremely lucky because they like as i said the open beaches that are interesting for us for landing operations because they are very swelly a lot of movements but if you are getting there it's uh, something that i promise you you're not going uh, to forget. There's always a question as well that we get from guests, or oh, I want to see the chicks. When can I see the chicks? Beginning, middle, end of the season. And the good thing is with the king penguins, you don't have to worry because no matter when you come, they're always going to be chicks. They're always going to be penguins that have an egg uh, balancing on their feet because they do have a very, very unusual breeding cycle. Um, it takes them more than a year to raise one chick. So you have to imagine they lay an egg in November. First, the male takes care of it for around 14 days while the female is out feeding. The female returns and it takes care of 14 days and then they switch for around all four days. After 50 days, they, they hatch and then um, it takes around uh, six weeks after it's hatched and uh, later on it has this brown coat and by the way the first explorers thought it's a different kind of penguin they couldn't they couldn't imagine how something like this like a fluffy coat like this could become a beautiful king penguin but if you have time yes i do yeah it will happen eventually the the young chicks 
They are coming together. They form crashes or kindergartens once again, while the adults are going out uh, feeding. And now we are coming to April. And once again, November, the egg is laid, it's hatched. They are a little bit bigger. Now we have around April, they are nearly fully grown. And now the winter comes. They are not ready to go to sea because they still don't have the real feathers. So they have to survive the Antarctica winter. And then hopefully the next time or the next uh, time spring comes, they are ready to mold and then they are going to have their real feathers and then they can go out. So it's a long breeding cycle. But maybe the parents have already decided in December to lay another egg. And then that's why they have two breeding cycles. And you always have some penguins that are still on eggs. And you will always see these very nice and fluffy chicks. Okay. And they're, they're really fantastic. It's a, <laughs> You, you can sit for hours and I can only recommend to come on a small expedition vessel where you really have a lot of time to just sit because you can sit in front of this one, I promise you, for three hours and do not get bored and just watch one chick. It will be fantastic. Absolutely. Just to add here, by a small vessel, uh, we do mean something not more than 100 or 120 passengers because sometimes, you know, the... Um, notion of big and small differs a little bit but yes it, uh, the idea in here is that the smaller the ship is it means that you have more time at each point at each point yeah that is that is uh, something that can only be recommended and uh, really you want to spend as much time as you can it doesn't mean that you have to be out for three hours you can go back anytime but you have a chance if you wish. And I mean, you come there once in your life, so you better stay out. That's, that's my opinion. Um, there are some penguins that we find here as well that are, for example, the rock hopper and macaroni, just a few slides. And just before we start, how do you know what is what? Because they do look quite similar. They are both a bit evil looking with the red eyes. But on the left hand side, you see one of the smallest polar penguins, and that is a rock hopper on the left hand side yeah? and on the right hand side the one that looks a bit more fancy that is a macaroni uh, penguin and the difference is you how you can see it is that it has a joint um, uh, feathers at the forehead so it has a nice uh, yellow feather crown let's call it and that is an, uh, a macaroni it's a bit smaller um, it's bigger actually than the rock hopper as well so here we have a rock hopper in its best and in its glory, the red eyes. They, they like to breed on rocks. We find them a lot on the Falklands, actually, the Falklands Malvinas. The males are also here the first ones. They are building the nest. Same, they have two uh, small eggs. And uh, usually they do breed together with other birds. For example, very, very common. You find them in big rookeries and you find them here with uh, cormorants. Or, for example, you can find them with a black-browed albatross. And they, these are typical birds to find on the Falklands, on the Malvinas. The macaroni always gives us trouble in the expedition team. I really have to tell you. This is a bird that people want to see. Some people want to cross off how many different kind of penguins they want to see. They were reading in the books that actually this is the most abundant penguin that we have in the Southern Hemisphere. 12 million of them. And now the expedition team comes and tells you, these are for us the hardest ones to find. People are looking always as if you are a bit crazy, but the macaroni is really hard to find because um, they really like to be in areas that are nearly not accessible for us, especially in South Georgia. They like to have very steep cliffs and they breed on the top of the cliffs where it, where it's really hard to go. Um, you also see now the very nice crest. And macaroni, by the way, if you don't know, the name comes from, was given by the British. And uh, the British in the 18th century, they were going down to Italy. And then they came back and they had a fashion of dyeing their hair in nice little streaks and bring the Italian fashion to Great Britain. And the other Brits thought it's so hilarious. They called them macaronis. Yeah, because they were down in Italy. And, and this is the name where uh, it comes from. 
And now I see that I do my hair like this. I also look like a macaroni. So here we go. Um, but they are like crested <laughs> penguins. They do fish uh, for krill and squid. And please, if you go on an expedition, you are on an expedition. Because this one is best to see because they are so high up for us with a zodiac. That means we have to go either very early when they come down for the feeding or very late in the evening. So if you travel with me to South Georgia, and I don't know if I did that with Bob as well when he was there, it's not uncommon that I wake you up at four in the morning and we go out at 4.30. Yeah, and because that is the time where we can see them. I mean, you can sleep later, we have sea days, but if you want to see some specific types of wildlife, you have to also go there at specific types so, and time. So we appreciate when you stay with us and I always think as soon as the expedition team and the entire ship is ready to go early, there must be something so special that you better also get up. I hope it was right, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and it's absolutely worth it. It's really worth it. It's fantastic. Yeah. So we talk okay. about the elephant seals as well, because I think that's one of the really epic uh, species that you can see over there. Yeah. and. Uh, Elephant seals are, I must say, they're my favorite ones uh, of, of the seals because they have an attitude and I appreciate that very much and they have a character. They're the largest seals in the world. Um, the males can be up to five meters long and they are around four tons for the, uh, for the females. Uh, and No, no, sorry, four tons for the males. So very heavy, a lot of blubber that you have in front of you. And, but they are in disguise in my mind because once this elephant seal is moving it is moving and nothing can stop it and i appreciate that i think it's a it's a very nice uh, for the for the seals they are extreme deep divers there have been records that they can dive up to 1000 meters they mainly go for the uh, squid and they do occupy the beaches and when you have kings usually you find also elephant seals uh, here uh, around. In the, and here it depends what you want to see uh, when you travel. If you want to see bulls fighting, the, what you see in the documentaries, where, sort of where they really hit the heads, that is usually the beginning of the season. That is uh, in around, uh, let's say, October, November, because they come and they establish their harems. A lot of fights uh, going on there. A little bit later, the females are also arriving. It's it's amazing. It's a lot of sound, what you hear. It's a lot of roaring. It's like really fighting. So a good time. I like it very much in October, November. One bull is very busy and after the season, extremely exhausted because it has to take care of around 50 females. I mean, that's a job. Many men have a problem with one, but I imagine 50 of them. And he has to be the beach master. But you know what? There are always others that want to be beach master as well. So he has to really guard his harem from intruders and others that want to take his females. It's exhausting this job. The um, pups, when they are born, they are quite big. They are already nine kilos heavy. And um, while they are getting their milk from the mom, which is considerably smaller, you see her, her on the right hand side. Um, while the, the female is feeding with milk for around four weeks, the pup gains nine kilos a day. Yeah, it needs to really gain quickly. That's but as much as it gains, the mother is losing. So the mother loses around 130, 140 kilos of her weight during the time that she is milk feeding and she cannot leave. And I think that is also quite special. The name elephant seal, well, it's a big size. So elephant, but also you see this kind of trunk uh, that they have in the front. And usually you say that they can reach the biggest trunk when they are from nine, nine years approximately um, uh, onwards, that they have this big trunk. They, by the way, they can inflate it, very impressive. They can inflate it and then it turns really red to attract the females uh, as well. So it's not easy to be an elephant seal male. That's all what I want to say. So they need their resting. They uh, really need to take care of themselves. And after 
the mating is over again. They come back after the feeding and then they have to go through another process that is now a little bit more calm, but now they are molting. They are losing, they are shedding their uh, uh, fur and that takes 40 days where they cannot go to sea and they are laying then peacefully around in the muddy areas and uh, well, very, very nice ones uh, to see. You see uh, those half grown ones, let's say from uh, February approximately onwards, they can be between 12 and 15 years old, but fantastic. And South Georgia is a place to go. Yeah. And now I have another seal for you. Not too many, please don't worry, stay with me. Fur seals. And uh, the fur seals were very, very much hunted. They were nearly down to extinction um, during the time of the sealers because they have a very dense and fur uh, skin. But um, now we have around one and a half to two million in South Georgia. So they are making a really speedy uh, recovery. Fur seals, here you see a bull, are up to 100 kilos heavy. And they are very specific because the flippers um, they can, they can uh, really move their flippers, which other seals cannot do. That means they can run very quickly. Also uh, on land, they are very agile. When they come in the beginning of the season, they like to show that they are the boss, also like to be the beach masters. And um, they have also quite a harem, not as big as the elephant seals, but let's say they can take care of six or 10 of them they think. Mm -hmm. But now scientists have found out that actually when, uh, when a male thinks that this is his harem, later on, around 30% of this offspring from this group is not his. <laughs> there was somebody bugging in and like also mating when he wasn't watching. So he has to learn a little bit from the elephant seals, but they are really funny. And you find them all around. The, the young ones are born in November to mid-December. They are fed for around uh, 12 weeks. They have a very high uh, content of fat in the milk, so they grow very quickly. And sometimes we see these logistic ones. Once again, the pigmentation is different. We also call them blondies. And we don't have to worry. It doesn't seem to have any impact that they have a different color on their breeding success or hunting success. So uh, they are doing very, very well. That sounds amazing. Uh, and to be honest, I think for those who are into wildlife, for those travelers who think that that's number one thing for them to see, they have to add uh, South Georgia and Falkland Islands to their trip. It's absolutely worth it. And it will definitely be once in a lifetime experience. Um, while we were showing you the pictures, uh, I think you have seen a lot of passengers taking pictures of the wildlife. And I think it's also important uh, that we take a couple of minutes and talk about how we behave when we are traveling to these absolutely beautiful, pristine areas to see the wildlife and their natural habitat. Anya, would you like to say a couple of words? Yeah, and actually the, ne the next slide we named very fittingly social distancing in Antarctica. Exactly. <laughs> that is what it is all about. We are coming to an area where we want to experience a wildlife. That is one of the biggest things. I mean, please keep in mind what I have tried now to put into yeah, a little bit more than an hour, we were hoping. These are six, seven lectures already uh, combined. So we want to show you a lot. We want to be with the wildlife, but in the way that we don't interfere. Yeah? That is not, we, we are the visitors and we are a member of the IATU which is the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, and they have guidance and rules, regulations, how to approach the wildlife and do not give them uh, any uh, disturbance. For example, there are for whales uh, guidelines that we, when we see them with a zodiac, we do a very slow approach. How close can we go, depending if they're traveling, if they are feeding, that we do not get in between uh, the groups of wildlife, that we stay with the zodiacs on one side, so the uh, whales can move freely and that we don't not speed up. So please, also when you're with us in the boat, the driver knows what they are doing and they will always make sure that you have 
the best experience, but we want that the whale stays where it is, if possible. And you have the possibilities to take really, really nice mm. pictures. And sometimes it's much more worth to stay in an area with a zodiac and not speed around because there's a whale over there or a whale over there. That's not the purpose. You have to have patience as well. And then you can have very, very great encounters. Sometimes you see the fluke, like we have here, for example. Sometimes the whales are so curious, and especially if you behave properly, they are coming very close to you. And I'm leading for 20 years, but I can still tell you if a 15 meter humpback dives under your boat, that is, that is quite special. So it's well worth to wait for those, uh, for those moments. Or when you have a killer whale, an orca behind you, and you have the two meter dorsal fin coming up behind your zodiac, I have a good fascination and I have a very good imagination that pops in my mind, but it's great experiences if you behave properly and do not rush. The main thing is to take things a bit down. The main thing also for behavior for you is put your binoculars, take your binoculars, take them with you. We go out cruising. We can see a lot. The more people are looking, we have the seals on the ice. If now suddenly all the zodiacs rush together and go from all around, the seal is disturbed. So slowly, one by one, we will approach from one side. If a seal, for example, is raising the head, which many people think it's funny, it's actually disturbed. So we have to change our behavior to make sure that we all have a great, um, uh, great, great experience. And, you know, there is a rule also that says you cannot approach penguins closer than five meters. Well, tell you what, penguins don't know five meter rules. I've never heard about them. Trying for 20 years, doesn't work. <laughs> if you are quiet and if you sit down, the wildlife, like the penguins, they might approach you. And that is absolutely no problem. Like I think this picture is really good because we are on one side, penguin has his space. It can move around nicely, quickly. There is no stress for the wildlife as well. We are silent, we are approaching the wildlife. And that is when you really have the great encounters. So please, when the team briefs you on guidelines, don't take it to like, we want to tell you, or you can do this and this. This is how you can have the best experience. And that's why this social distancing is of extreme importance. And the more you, you do this, the better your experience is going to be when you travel and you want to see the wildlife that we have in Antarctica. That sounds great. And even if you do follow this, all of these rules, like Anya mentioned, you do get really the best experience and absolutely amazing once in a lifetime uh, encounters with the wildlife. And there was really lots of uh, interesting facts. Uh, some we, we have mentioned some myth, uh, myths about the behavior patterns of different species and we really hope that you have enjoyed it. And if you don't mind, we can also take a couple of questions, uh, sorry, a couple of minutes to answer your questions. So please, if you have any at the moment, type them into the chatter box and we together with Anya will be very glad to answer them. And we will, we will give it a couple of minutes. <laughs> and while we're waiting for the questions, uh, what I can say is that in the follow-up email after this webinar, we will send you the reference for the book that Anya mentioned for those who are really keen to learn more about Antarctica, about its wildlife. And we will also include a very interesting video for you from one of our departures about the wildlife and about Antarctica itself. Uh, we do have one of the questions, Anya. Uh, it is, when penguins' parents set their chicks free to live independently, when does it happen for chicks? Like, when do they get independent? Well, the, uh, the chicks, they are going to be together in these kindergartens. Let's talk, for example, about the shin strips. They are going to be in the crushes in the kindergartens. And the parents at this time are still coming back uh, for the feeding for approximately, let's say, one month approximately. Don't, don't count me on the dates now. Um, afterwards, the parents are going then for themselves. They do not take care then of the chicks anymore. And they, the chicks have to be independent. That is when you see then these groups of uh, teenagers going towards uh, the sea when they lose basically the, the down feathers 
and then they are ready to go. They, they really have to take care of themselves very, very quickly, except once again for the king penguin. Thank you very much, Anya. It's, I hope it answers uh, the question. And uh, we have a lot of comments uh, in the chatterbox at the moment about everyone. Uh, well, first of all, thanking for the great information on the webinar, but the other part of it is coming back to Antarctica. Everyone is waiting for the moment to be able to get out there to explore, to take guests and to show these absolutely beautiful areas. While well, we are looking at the future with the hope and of course monitoring the situation uh, in the areas where we are, you know, where we are about to go. So stay tuned. If you don't have any other questions at the moment, we really hope that you have enjoyed the information and we did cover a lot, like Anya mentioned. <laughs> I was really rushing. I was really trying, but it was a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, things to cover. So I must say also, uh, I appreciate very much uh, that you were sticking around. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk about it. And well, I could talk for days. So, and I really try to make it as quick as possible with with good information and we hope you enjoyed it. And I also thank Kate for organizing uh, those webinars. I, I hope they were interesting for everybody. Thank you, Anya. And thank you everyone, dear friends from different places in the world. We are really appreciating the time that you spend with us. We love sharing the experience and knowledge about the polar world. And we do hope to see you sometime soon on our ships going and exploring these beautiful areas. Thank you for your time. Stay tuned for, for other webinars. And of course, at any time, you have, if you have any questions, please feel free to call us or to send us a message in the email. We are always here for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for all the attention and for your time. And enjoy the upcoming weekend, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and course, they... uh, special, special thanks to Anya. Thank you. That was really great. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.